We don't want your guilt. We don't want your fragility. We want your assistance and your help if you're coming with a true purpose and a genuine of heart. That's it. That's it. Because we are not victim. If you're coming with a victim mentality, reject it. We reject that. We're not victims. We are empowered for greatness. Thank you so much for liking your comments and subscribing to the channel. Please share this with your friends. Smash that like button. Smash the subscription bell. Share this with everybody you know. We're trying to make sure people understand that they're not victims, that they are empowered for greatness. And all this stuff that's out here that's telling them otherwise is false and will not benefit them in the end. So please, I appreciate that. Share that. You know, the one thing that really bothers me is when white progressive liberals feel as if they have to be the savior of black people. And what really bothers me is when white progressive Christians take on that savior mentality. Look, there's only one savior. His name is Jesus. Black people do not need white progressive liberals and white progressive Christians telling them how to live because they think they know best. And that's what socialism and Marxism and communism is. And that's what the nanny state is. Robin D'Angelo has a new book out called Nice Racism. And when you look at the book, the title actually implicates progressive liberals in perpetuating racism. Now, I don't believe that racism is embedded in the fabric of this nation. I believe racism is a sin and anybody can commit that sin, regardless of skin tone. I mean, black people own slaves. Does that make black people racist? Because they own other blacks? Does it? See, the way I see this is, I see Robin D'Angelo as the face of black inferiority. And I'm not just pinpointing her, I'm pinpointing her, using her as the icon for everybody that thinks like her. Everybody that thinks like her, unintentionally, they think that their behavior will somehow change what they call as racism. But see, to me, that's like a superiority mentality because it's all dependent upon you. That's similar to the white man's burden where the white man felt compelled to go out and help the indigenous people or help people that were not white because they felt it as their burden. It's the same deal. It is saying that white people are here, everybody else is here, and it's upon them to fix everything. That they have the sole power and the sole responsibility to fix everything. But see, what that leads to is the problems that we're facing. That leads to the problems that we're facing in our communities because the people with that kind of mentality usually enact policies and programs that harm the folks they're looking to help. America is a republic. America is founded on Judeo-Christian values. America is founded on the fact that each individual has their own free will, period. There is equality of opportunity, but there's not equality of outcomes. And what people like Robin D'Angelo and others who think like her, who think that racism is the bedrock of this nation, they think that by changing their behaviors, by changing what they do, by becoming more aware, more woke, then they can fix things. But see, that's a problem. What that does, that gives them all the power and that leaves black people helpless. All this stuff about white guilt and white fragility, it's all centered around white people. If you really dig into it, it's all saying that white people are here and black people are here. And it's up to white people to fix black people's problems. That's not the case. Black people do not need white people to fix our problems. We don't. And what irks me is when black Christians subscribe to this stuff. We don't need anybody else to fix our problems. We have the solution. It's returning to the Bible. It's returning to a relationship with Christ. That's the solution. We don't need other people trying to fix problems in a community when they've contributed and caused the problems. We don't, that's like, I'm taking my car to the mechanic, right? And 
I'm supposed to trust them to fix it. But when I take it in, the car runs fine. But when I drive off, the car starts to break down. So you're gonna expect me to trust that person who broke my car when it was in perfect condition to now fix it? That's what you are essentially saying, the white liberals and the white progressives are saying, look, we know what's better for you. We know what's best for you. We have compassion. We know. We, we are the elite. We know what you need. You're not smart enough. You're a child. You're not smart enough to know what you need. You're not smart enough. So let us come alongside and tell you what you need. It's taking God out of the situation. It's taking God out of the equation. And it's inserting man's wisdom. So when you listen to her talk about what led to the book or some of her examples, it's clear that yes, there were some things going on inside of her that were not necessarily racist, but just ignorant. New book is Nice Racism, How Progressive White People Perpetuate Racial Harm. It argues well-meaning people can fuel racism. Robin D'Angelo joins us now for an interview you're seeing first on CBS This Morning. Robin, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. First of all, what exactly is nice racism? Because those two words well, don't nice go racism. together, Robin. Those two the, words, are... nice and racism, do not go together. Well, if it grabs your attention, that's a good thing. We need to grab uh, one another's attention and start having a uh, difficult conversation or continue having that conversation. But the explicit uh, acts of racism are fairly recognizable, you know, epithets and slurs. Uh, but there are many more subtle manifestations. And because they're more subtle, they're more insidious. Uh, they're often perpetrated by well-meaning people uh, who are not aware that they are causing harm uh, and are in denial about that. Robin, you, you say in the book that you've been guilty of this yourself, that you, you've made your own missteps. What, what, what are you, were you referring to? Oh, well, absolutely. I, I'm well aware that I have perpetrated racial harm across my life. And I'm also well aware that not one moment of that was intentional or, or conscious. But it still caused harm. And an example I opened the book with is uh, back when I was in college, and I'm a non-traditional student, so I was in my 30s at this point in my life. Uh, my partner at the time uh, and I were visiting uh, another city, and there were some friends of hers she wanted to look up. So we made plans to meet this couple at a restaurant. Um, I had never met them before, and when we got to the restaurant, I saw that they were both black. And at that point in my life, I didn't know any black people. I was rarely ever around black people. And I was excited. Uh, I wanted to immediately <laughs> establish that I was not racist. So how did I do that? I proceeded to regale them all night long with stories about how racist my family was. Uh, I shared every joke, every comment, <laughs> followed by, can you believe they said that? Mm. Thinking that what I was demonstrating was that I, I recognized those things as racist and I would never say those things. Yeah, so that what made I was you better than your family. Doing, yeah, that made you yeah, better than I your was, family. Yeah. Yes, but I was subjecting this couple all night long to all those comments. And I would not have brought the conversation to race if they had not been black. So I was also objectifying them. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't paying any attention to their signals as they grew more and more uncomfortable. And maybe the last point to pull from that example is my partner, uh, while she wasn't participating in those comments, she also wasn't interrupting them. Mm -hmm. And so she contributed to, to uh, allowing that to happen. And that's a great example. My intentions were to show I wasn't racist, but the impact of my behavior was racism. Yeah, I, listen, Robin, when I read that, I, I sort of laughed, but I was also cringing for you because I've been yeah. in a situation with white people and they'll pull out pictures of, look at my brother-in-law, look at my daughter-in-law, look at the things that I've done. And I'm thinking, now, why are you showing me this? Or I have a friend right. who's sick and it turns out she's black and they just wanted me to know about it. So I, I, I yeah. really related to what you were saying. But what was fascinating to me is here you were in your 30s, you had had very little contact with black people. And you said 75% of whites in this country have little or no contact with black people in their lives. I, I thought that was so fascinating to me. Yeah, that's based on a survey by the uh, Public Religion Research uh, Institute. And 
I think it's pretty clear uh, in most white uh, people's lives. Most white people live segregated lives um, and are not taught to feel any sense of loss about that. And if we're being honest, in large part, we measure the value of space, of neighborhoods, of schools by the absence of black people. But Robin, For what me, do you say to people? Because I want to get this point. When you say there's Robin trying to make white people feel guilty again, <laughs> what is your response to that? I, I think that's a, a willful misreading of my work. I'm not interested in guilt. It, it serves no good purpose. Um, I'm clear that I have uh, per, uh, participated and per perpetuated racism in my life. I don't feel guilty about that. I didn't choose to be conditioned in a uh, society in which racism is the bedrock. And the anecdote to guilt is uh, reparative action, yeah. uh, responsibility. I Again, I didn't choose my conditioning, but I am responsible for the outcome of it. And when you change your understanding of what racism is, when you move past this idea that it's an either or proposition, you know, either good people or bad people, uh, guilt becomes moot. And it's true. A lot of white people do not associate with black people. Does that make them racist? Does it? I don't think it makes them racist. I just think that people tend to naturally gravitate and associate with people they feel the most comfortable with. Now, would I want more white people to interact with black people? Of course, but I want the interaction to be genuine. I don't want you coming at me as if I'm helpless, as if I can't have my own agency and that you have to help me out. No, if you are doing it out of the kindness of your heart, truly with true intentions, not to make yourself look better, not to appease some kind of guilt you have on the inside of you, okay we can chat but you're coming at me to appease some kind of guilt that's on the inside of you i don't need that assistance we don't need that assistance black people are not helpless that's the point i'm attempting to make here black people are not helpless despite what the media wants to say despite what white progressive liberals want to say black people are not helpless we can achieve just as much or more as white people we can but there have been hindrances put in place by white progressives to keep us in bondage, to keep us under. Just as facts. These policies that have been implemented by white progressives have kept the majority of black people in place and has caused them to feel left behind and has led to the rise of this feeling that there's systemic oppression when there's not. But it's because of these policies and because of the mentality of people like Robin D'Angelo that has contributed to this, as if they have all the solutions, as if they can just change their behavior, they can just change the way they perceive the world. There's this there's a video I'm gonna play in a second about this 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 progressive pastor at Harvard Divinity School. He's a professor, and he talks about whiteness, and he talks about it, and when you listen to it. It is not coherent. It is the most incoherent thing I've heard. Just just, just listen to it. Uh, call themselves uh, of color if that is the, some sort of uh, intent, it, the dialectical other of whiteness. Uh, that's a fantastic question that I spend lots of time thinking about, in fact. Um, I have an opinion on the matter, and then I have a kind of uh, professional answer. And the professional answer is that White folks, we are now in this situation of moral particularity. What I mean by that is we have existed in this in a social situation where we have only ever allowed ourselves to live in and through others. So insofar as we now know that we need to turn to our own pile of cultural resources, the only thing we have to turn to are bad things. I mean that axiomatically. There's not anything preservable of whiteness, period. So, that, I mean, that's my opinion on the matter. Um, but that puts us in a uh, an existential bind. It means we either celebrate this pernicious form of whiteness or we appropriate. That's a that's a complicated issue that uh, would require a kind of uh, a broader scale, more democratically oriented uh, 
set of perspectives in order to adjudicate the 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 right and the wrong the this and then that from that issue but that's that's just where i'll leave the answer is that white folks now find themselves in this existential paradox robin wegman has written on this uh, jennifer harvey in the study of religion has probably written what i think is the best uh, treatment of this the the paradox of white moral particularity that is we know enough now to know that we can't be who we've been, but we also know that we can't be the other. So who will we be and how will we respond to that challenge is one that I think in the study of religion, whether that's religious studies or theology, I think we as as fields, as, as discourses, have a lot to offer those uh, topics, but we've really just now started the engines running uh, in terms of uh, applying what we know to those to those issues to those problems. So, and when you hear this, that goes to show you the mentality of people like that. They think that they have the sole burden and responsibility to fix what ails this country. That they're the ones who can fix it instead of coming alongside and say, you know what, the Bible talks about unity the bible talks about harmony let us all look to truth to find the solutions no they look to themselves they look to philosophy they look to theories to come up with solutions all that does is continue the negative cycle and you know who it hurts it hurts the people they claim to help no we do not need your help we do not need your saving there's one savior and we're good with him. He's already done the job and he'll do it much better than you ever could even think about doing it. So we don't need your help. We don't need your assistance. You can come alongside and provide true solutions that enable us and empower us because we are not victims. We are empowered for greatness. If you want to do that, then we can chat. But if not, move out the way. Move out the way and let us have our own agency. Move out the way and let us be the people that God has ordained and called us to be. We do not need your assistance if you're not coming with that approach. We do not need your assistance if you're not coming with that mentality. We don't want your guilt. We don't want your fragility. We want your assistance and your help if you're coming with a true purpose and a genuine of heart. That's it. That's it. Because we are not, if you're coming with a victim mentality, reject it. We reject that. We're not victims. We are in power for greatness. We are not victims. We are empowered for greatness and we reject any and everybody that is perpetuating a victim mentality because we are not victims. We are empowered for greatness.